would like to introduce Professor Dipendra Prasad from Tata Institute of Mumbai and also has a position at St. Petersburg State University. Professor Prasad got a PhD in Harvard University, advised by Benedict Gross. He is a professor at the Tata Institute for the past decade, and earlier he was at the Harishandra Research Institute in Allahabad for about a decade. He is a number theorist known for his work in the areas of automorphic representations and number theory. And he will talk about X analogs of branching laws. All right, thank you. Uh, pleasure to be here in this ICM. Uh, it's a great day, so thank you all for coming. Uh, the purpose of uh, this lecture is to consider certain uh, classical questions in uh, representation theory uh, using some methods from homological algebra. So uh, questions in representation theory are of very classical origin. Methods in homological algebra also have been there for a long time. But to bear on these questions, maybe they have not been put to use. And uh, uh, this is what this talk will be about, to bring in some methods from homological algebra. Uh, I will begin my lecture by re recalling what these classical questions that I am talking about. So these are uh, questions about uh, a restriction of a representation of a group G to one of its subgroups. Uh, uh, this is a very classical topic. Uh, I give a few examples here, but uh, uh, this subject is full of beautiful examples. Uh, this is also a subject uh, which finds application in many physical sciences uh, and uh, often is referred to as symmetry breaking. Uh, among all uh, branching laws or the restriction problem, I think Klepsch Gordon theorem has. Uh, some special place, and therefore I begin my lecture by re recalling what it is. Uh, it says that if you take tensor product of two finite dimensional irreducible representations of SU2, then it breaks up uh, in a very nice way, and all representations which appear, appear with multiplicity one. So here, pi m is the unique irreducible representation of SU2 of dimension m plus one. So uh, this is what is called a branching law. You know, you decompose a representation of a bigger group, in this case, SU2 cross SU2, and you restrict it to the diagonal SU2, and you ask the question, how does it decompose? So uh, questions of this kind about tensor product, uh, about restriction from uh, uh, classical groups to smaller classical groups, they have been well studied. Uh, uh, so there is this uh, uh, questions uh, on symmetric group from SN plus 1 to the subgroup SN. That also has a very beautiful answer. And then there are also more complicated answers about little old Richardson rules. Uh, so um, in some sense, it is uh, important to realize that uh, these examples that I was talking about uh, there are two important features to these examples of compact groups. Uh, one is that all the representations one is dealing with are finite dimensional, and uh, more relevant to the talk today is the fact that the representations are completely reducible. Every representation is a direct sum. Every representation, every sub-representation has a complement. And uh, this, uh, neither of these will be available to us as we discuss non-compact groups in the lecture. So this lecture will be mostly about PRD groups. Uh, the, so we, we, we will uh, proceed towards that. Uh, mm. But before I get into that, just to uh, uh, say that uh, these uh, n uh, subtleties about non-compact groups uh, can be seen already in the, one of the simplest cases, that if you look at uh, compactly supported continuous functions on a non-compact group, then it carries a invariant form given by the Haar measure. You can integrate a function, and that's a G invariant linear form. But uh, if the group is non-compact, then CCG does not contain the constants. 
So which means that uh, this representation CCG is not completely reducible if G is non-compact. So in some sense, existence of the hard measure is one of the important issues. And uh, uh, this example, in some ways, uh, uh, plays a role in much of the development. OK, so considering the restriction of a representation of a group G to one of its subgroup, and I am being a little more specific here, from orthogonal group uh, on a quadratic space V to a uh, orthogonal subgroup on a co-dimension one subspace uh, has been a very fruitful direction of research through its connections to questions on period integrals. So I think uh, uh, the local theory meets the global theory via theory of period integrals. And uh, period integrals have uh, many applications, including questions about subconvexity, which uh, Achha Venkatesh was speaking about. Uh, or which uh, Peter Sarnak was speaking about. OK. So uh, to be precise, uh, uh, the questions that I am going to address are related to HOM spaces, HOM pi 1, pi 2 for irreducible admissible representation, pi 1 of SOV and pi 2 of SOW. So you have an orthogonal group in n variable and in n minus 1 variable. And you are asking which representation of the orthogonal group in n minus 1 variable arise as a quotient of the representation of the bigger group. So in some sense, uh, uh, this is the question. And one of the first important results about this is that it has multiplicity one property. That this home space is at most one dimensional. Uh, so all, if you wanted to understand this multiplicities, all you need to know is when it is 0 and when it is 1. So uh, somehow it, uh, it is difficult to imagine that a question of this kind uh, can be very difficult. And, uh, uh, but even this multiplicity 1 theorem, I think, has been long in the making. I think uh, it has been expected for a long, long time. But it is only in 2010 and 2012 that it was proved. And uh, I think uh, uh, it was anticipated from a uh, long time. So I think even this uh, basic property now was not so easy to come by. OK. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, in fact, want to add here that uh, uh, before the multiplicity one theorem was proved, even finite dimensionality of the space was not known. So you know, since we are dealing with infinite dimensional spaces, multiplicity a priori could be quite arbitrary, not only some other integer, but it could be also infinite. But also there is this uh, problem in the opposite direction, that you know, uh, since the representation of the larger group is infinite dimensional, it may have no cosines. So it, it may be also identically 0. So in some ways, it could be identically infinite, or it could be identically 0. So the f fact that eventually the answers are quite nice and pretty, I think it is after multiplicity 1 theorem has been proven. OK, so with the multiplicity 1 theorem uh, proved, one goes on to prove a more precise description of the set of irreducible representations. Uh, uh, so these have become available in a series of papers due to Walsh-Perge and Moegla Walsh-Perge uh, for orthogonal groups. And uh, Bojart Plasis has similar uh, uh, results for unitary groups. Uh, so I give some of the references. Uh, these are all very recent works. This is not what I am here to talk about. Uh, but anyway, these are also very uh, difficult and intricate works. Uh, but uh, I just want to add that uh, a complete answer on the multiplicity naturally requires one to completely classify irreducible representations of the orthogonal group. You want to have an answer in, some, uh, in terms of some parameterization of the representations. Unless you can lay your hands on the representation, you cannot say which representations appear in which representations. Even in the kleps gordon theorem, one began by saying that they are parameterized by integers. So here you need a classification of irreducible representations of the orthogonal group. Uh, 
to be able to answer this question in its, uh, in its full. So the only classification known for representations of PRD groups is what is called the local Langlands correspondence in terms of enhanced Langlands parameters. And these have become available through the works of Jim Arthur and others for non archimedean local fields. So somehow it depends on, uh, again, very recent progresses. Uh, OK, so given the interest in these home, home spaces, it is also natural to consider the extra spaces. Somehow uh, this does not take us by surprise. Uh, uh, and in fact, homological algebra methods suggest that the simplest answers are not for the individual spaces, but for the alternating sum of their dimensions, which is called the Euler Poincare uh, characteristic of the representation. So, you know, uh, just to remind you, pi 1 is a representation on a bigger group and pi 2 is a representation on the smaller group, and one is trying to understand the home spaces or the X spaces, which generalize the home spaces. So uh, in any case, uh, uh, these uh, Euler-Poincare uh, pairings are known to be much more uh, flexible. They are more general. Uh, they make sense not only for representations, but also for virtual representations. They make sense for non-irreversible representations. Uh, and uh, uh, somehow uh, uh, they have, um, so it's supposed to be much more general and more flexible. Uh, so in some sense, the aim is not to ask more complicated questions for the sake of complication, but eventually to simplify what the complicated answers were in the beginning, one hopes. Okay, so of course, this has to be always kept in mind that uh, before we can define the Euler-Poincare pairing, uh, one must prove that these extra spaces are finite dimensional, because you know, as I said that for home spaces, it was not obvious. It's not at all obvious that the home spaces are finite dimensional, so these need to be proved to be finite dimensional. And one also needs to prove that these X spaces are zero beyond a certain range. So, yeah, so I think uh, oh, till now what I have said, I have just said very general things. So F being non archimedean local field perhaps did not play much of a role. Uh, so this is what uh, my talk will be about. Uh, so vanishing of higher x is a well-known generality. Uh, uh, for reductive PRD groups, it is known that these x ties are zero beyond the split rank of the group. So this is a standard application of the projective resolution of the trivial representation given by the bruha tits building. So this is a generality which is uh, uh, well-known. So vanishing beyond a point is there. All one needs to, therefore, do to justify the definition is to prove finite dimensionality. So, okay, so I think uh, before I do that, maybe I just want to recall a few notation and generalities. So, reductive PRD group and G is GF, RG is the abelian category of smooth representations. So, you know, uh, this category has enough projectives and enough injectives. So, you know, to define X groups, uh, one could uh, do it in uh, some generality also. But in any case, uh, the, uh, this uh, abelian category has enough projectives and enough injectives. For example, for any compact open subgroup K of G, compactly in induced from K to G of C is a projective object, and full induction is an injective object. So in fact, these uh, projective and injective uh, suffice for all my considerations, and uh, I don't need to worry beyond them. So once a category has enough projective and injective, it is meaningful to talk about X tie as derived functors of uh, home spaces. So you know, uh, since I do not expect all my audience to be experts in PRD groups, uh, I use just one slide to say that uh, for PRD group, representations are understood in two steps. Uh, one are the supercuspidal representations. Uh, these are irreducible representations of G, which do not arise as sub quotients of principal series, which uh, are obtained by inducing from a parabolic. So those are sub supercuspidal, which are not sub quotients, and then they are principal series representations, and they are sub quotients. So somehow irreducible representations are in two steps. Uh, 
Building blocks are supercuspidal, which are difficult for some purpose, easy for some purpose, and then there are the principal series, which are easy for some purpose, and their reducibility is a more subtler issue. Okay, so, uh, so you know, in this lecture, I'm talking about Euler Poincare of pi 1, pi 2, where pi 1 is a representation on the bigger group, and pi 2 is on the smaller group. So when you restrict pi 1 from g to the smaller group h, it is no more uh, admissible or finite length representation. It is uh, infinite length representation. But uh, I want to, in this slide, uh, talk to you about uh, what happens if you look at Euler-Poincare among finite length representations. So this is... Uh, obviously something which will motivate you to think further. And uh, the, this has been indeed studied. Uh, and uh, so Euler Poincare is a symmetric uh, bilinear form on growth and group of finite length representations. Uh, Euler Poincare is known to be trivial if one of the representation is a principal series. And uh, it is known that the Euler Poincare is locally constant in a family. And uh, somehow, this is, uh, in some sense, the most subtle statement, and it incorporates the previous statements. This is called the Kazan orthogonality, which expresses the Euler Poincare pairing between pi and pi prime in, in terms of characters. It's a form of sure orthogonality for finite groups. Sure orthogonality says that you, know, you can calculate pi pi prime in terms of integrating the characters. And uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this is the form of uh, sure orthogonality due to, I think it was conjectured by Kazdan, but uh, I think there are many proofs, but I, am, I understand that all the proofs are only in characteristic zero. So it is a difficult theorem. I think the first time it was proved was by uh, the paper of Schneider and Stuhler in IHES. So that one is a subtle theorem. In some sense, I am also emphasizing this because eventually we want to do something similar in greater generality. Okay, so... Uh, uh, so we already talked about the X. Uh, uh, we need to prove that it is uh, finite dimensional. So I just want to make uh, one or two comments about this finite dimensionality, which is that if you have an exact sequence of smooth G modules, and uh, you know, uh, Euler Poincare is additive, but uh, uh, the same exact sequences also say that if for any two of them you understand the Euler Poincare, then you understand for the third one. So finite dimensionality vanishing beyond a point, if you understand for any two of them, then it comes for free for the third one and then it adds up. So in some sense, uh, um, uh, that is the method of proof to prove something is finite dimensional. You kind of uh, simplify the representation. Okay, so uh, I make this comment that for the proof of finite dimensionality of x i, we note that for home spaces where we will have no idea how to prove finite dimensionality if both the representations are cuspidal because they are a bit mysterious. So for the home spaces, we will have no idea. But uh, if one was looking at x i, then exactly for these representations, we can apparently prove that these are finite dimensional because they are zero. And therefore, uh, as I said, uh, the representations are in uh, two, uh, two categories, supercuspidal or principal series. So it says then, then you can go on and try to prove it for principal series, and then uh, 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 these are inductive arguments on uh, uh, what kind of principal series you do and uh, uh, the split rank of the Levy and uh, the, there is some inductive argument on the size of the classical group. So this uh, can be done. Uh, the resulting analysis needs the notion of a Bessel model which will come up later, uh, which is also a restriction problem. Um, Right, so I think I am not talking about Bessel models here. In any case, uh, recently, very recently, there is a very general finiteness theorem for x i pi 1 pi 2, proving that in the context where home spaces were known to be finite dimensional, more or less x spaces are also finite dimensional. So this is uh, a preprint in last one year uh, by 
Rami Eisenberg and Sayag, uh, where they prove uh, finiteness in some general context. However, the approach via Bessel model, which intervenes when you analyze the principal series of SON plus one restricted to SN, SON, has as a bonus that uh, in some cases you have very explicit and interesting answers. Okay, so uh, uh, although you know I am I, not uh, uh, getting into any proofs, but uh, I think uh, as I said that. Uh, the methods are somehow inductive, and uh, in finite group theory, or also in PRD group theory, there is what is called the Mackey theory. When a group operates on a space, you, and you decompose the space in terms of the orbits, and somehow the representations have a filtration, and you filter the representation, and uh, it's that induction that one talks about. So the usual uh, uh, Mackey theory is about uh, understanding home spaces, and those spaces need to be turned into X spaces, and there is some generality in homological algebra which allows one to do. Uh, so abelian category, functor from A to B, and uh, it's an adjoint functor. Uh, if F and G are exact functors, then F maps injectives to injectives, and G maps projectives to projective, and uh, and there is some statement about, uh, just like the home spaces, there are X spaces which are isomorphic. Uh, and therefore, uh, there are many forms of Frobenius reciprocity in this subject. That's one of the uh, confusing parts of the subject that Frobenius reciprocity has several versions and uh, they all uh, uh, come in some ways or the other. Uh, home spaces are replaced by X spaces. So there is also a Frobenius reciprocity for parabolic induction in terms of what is called Jacquet modules. And the second one is what is called the second adjointness theorem of Bernstein. So they all have their extraversions and they all get used when one is doing the inductive arguments. But uh, we will not get into that. So I think uh, uh, the, now we get into a little more specifics about uh, branching large from GLN plus one to GLN. I uh, did not emphasize that GLN plus one to GLN also is an interesting example, but in some sense it is too simple for certain purposes. So it was not given so much importance before. Uh, so okay, uh, so somehow the simple reason why this was not paid too much importance to is that it is too simple. I, in this case, more or less, uh, everything appears, and everything appears with multiplicity one. Uh, okay, so uh, the previous theorem was uh, for irreducible generic representation to irreducible generic representation. So, you know, it has some hypothesis, irreducible and generic, for both pi one and for pi two. Uh, and now look at this euler poincare version of the above theorem which says that the, uh, so now instead of irreducible and generic, now it is for any admissible representation of finite length uh, for GLN plus one and for GLN. And uh, in this case, the X spaces are finite dimensional and uh, there is a very elegant answer in all generality. So uh, the euler poincare pairing is the product of uh, space of Whittaker models. And therefore, if there is a uniqueness of the Whittaker model for pi 1 or pi 2, then euler poincare is less than or equal to 1. So in particular, if pi 1 and pi 2 are irreducible representations, then euler poincare is less than or equal to 1. It is 0 if it is one of them is non-generic. Uh, so in some sense, uh, this certainly will justify our interest in X analogs, but uh, I think there is more to it. In some sense, one also wants to say that this is a much easier theorem than previous theorem. Somehow, this is really the point which I would like to emphasize, that to prove this theorem is easier than the previous one. And uh, for that reason, I have just, I am not giving you any proofs, but uh, I'm just saying that this the proof of this theorem is accomplished using some results of bernstein jelvinsky regarding the structure of representations of GLN plus one restricted to the mirabolic. So mirabolic uh, is a subgroup of GLN, 
which consists of the last row consisting of 0, 0, 0, 1. It contains GLN, but it's a little bigger than GLN. It's contained in that parabolic. And uh, Bernstein Jelvinsky defined uh, some notion of derivatives of a representation, which go from GLN plus 1 to GLN plus 1 minus i. And uh, of crucial importance is the fact that uh, the derivatives take admissible representation uh, finite length to finite length. And uh, Bernstein Jelinski proved that the restriction uh, has a finite filtration whose successive quotients are explicitly described by derivatives. So it is uh, the representation of the full GLN plus one is complicated, but restricted to the mirabolic, it is very simple minded. Somehow, if you are doing a branching problem on GLN, we don't need GLN plus one. We, uh, mirabolic is adequate, and they describe it on the mirabolic, and that's uh, good. So, uh, uh, Bernstein Jelvinsky and some forms of the Frobenius reciprocity about X group uh, uh, eventually follows from the following easy lemma, which says so this is some kind of a reduction that one does. That to prove that statement about Euler Poincare, you are reduced to a statement about Euler Poincare on smaller GLIs, GLDs. And the statement is that if there are two finite lens representations, then the Euler Poincare is zero. And uh, that, of course, would be obvious because it is uh, something which is locally constant in a family. And in GLN, you can uh, scale it by determinant to the power s. And then the central characters will become a part. And therefore, euler poincare will become 0. And therefore, since it's locally constant in a family, it has to be 0. So uh, even, eventually, this boils down to this simple lemma. And uh, so, OK. So uh, the next point uh, which uh, comes up is that uh, the following conjecture made by the speaker several years uh, ago seems to be a root of why simple and general result about Euler Poincare translates into this result about harm spaces. That you know, you have a statement about Euler Poincare, and you have also a statement about harm spaces. And if the representation is irreducible, generic, then uh, both of them give the answer one. And uh, I think the only reasonable uh, way to internalize that is to say that higher x are zero. So uh, uh, yeah, so in fact, I made this conjecture. In fact, I have been uh, thinking about this topic long time ago. And in fact, Vi Zhang reminded me that he got the Sastra Award in 2010 or 2012. And uh, there was a small conference in his honor in uh, for, for the Sasa Award, and I also gave a small lecture in which I began thinking about these matters. Okay, so this conjecture has, in fact, recently been proved. So this is really very encouraging for me. Gordon Savin is here, and uh, uh, he has done with one of his young collaborators, K.Y. Chan, that uh, uh, this is true on the nose. All right, so. <clears throat> I want to say that, uh, you know, uh, one might jump to conclusions that, uh, you know, one way to prove that some x are zero is to prove that some objects are projective objects or free objects. That is one way to prove that higher x are zero because uh, the representation pi one may become a projective object and then of course uh, x are zero, but uh, one cannot uh, remove uh, Genericity hypothesis for pi 1 or for pi 2. Uh, so this is the case for supercuspidal, and uh, uh, but even for generic pi 1, there are sometimes non-generic pi 2 for which the x are non-zero, and therefore it's not as if generic pi 1, they become projective modules. So there is some subtlety there, but uh, in fact, in the same paper of uh, Chan and Savin, uh, they prove that any discrete series representation becomes a projective module over GLN. And therefore, in particular, all these x are 0. OK. So later on, uh, we will have occasion to talk about a certain duality theorem due to Schneider and Stuhler. And uh, it will be a consequence of this vanishing theorem that uh, Discrete series representations of GLN plus 1 contain no irreducible submodules. They all appear as a cosine, but there are no submodules, no submodules.
So, uh, you know, uh, uh, right. So, uh, um, much of my interest uh, is in classical groups. As I said, GLN tends to be too simple, maybe not so simple here for X analogs, uh, uh, but uh, I am more interested in classical groups. Uh, I think they come up with uh, more notation, and uh, I think there is some uh, b uh, things to be introduced. Uh, but you know, I don't think I want to go through them. Maybe I will uh, quickly pass over them. One of the points is, which I already made to prove finite dimensionality, there is some inductive argument. You are restricting a principal series from G to H by doing some kind of a Mackey theory, and it builds up some uh, um, inductive structure, and which involves what are called Bessel models. Uh, uh, they have become quite popular, too, these days. Uh, uh, but I, I, I do not want to say anything except to say that uh, uh, they are defined for quadratic space and quadratic subspace when the subspace has odd co-dimension. And the Bessel subgroup is a subgroup of SOV which contains SOW as its reductive part. And it has a certain unipotent part. And it comes equipped with a character which is left invariant by SOW. So this is what the Bessel subgroup is. Uh, it is in between SOW and the Whittaker model. So somehow these are the two extremes of Bessel subgroups, and uh, in the inductive argument, those two extremes uh, intervene. OK, so uh, as I said, uh, there are some results of this uh, kind about Euler Poincare. Uh, they seem somehow reminiscent of what I said about GLN. Eventually, they will use those results about GLN. Uh, but uh, in any case, I don't think I will have time, so I leave it at that. Uh, I think this definition has been put uh, just for the convenience at hand uh, that a finite length representation of a classical group will be called full principal series if it is irreducible and supercuspidal, or it is a full induced representation. Full induced representation coming from supercuspidal on the classical group. So this already needs, uh, this is a Principal series coming from a maximal parabolic, and pi naught is a representation on GL, and sigma naught is a representation on a smaller orthogonal group. So, uh, yeah, so this is what I said is analogous to the theorem about GLN that in some cases, the Euler Poincare has the same structure as what it was for GLN. So, I think these are. Uh, uh, full principal series, it could be supercuspidal, in which case there is not much to be said here. Uh, but in any case, I just want to show you that uh, there is some inductive procedure to calculate Euler Poincare. Along the way, you prove finite dimensionality, but also you calculate it in some cases, uh, the value of the Euler Poincare. Okay, so this is just a question that uh, we see a large number of cases where Euler Poincare is zero or one. Is there a multiplicity one for Euler Poincare or for X? So this I have no idea. Okay, so now I want to talk to you about uh, one of the most important uh, ingredients in those theorems, trying to understand restriction problem from SON plus one to SON. It is called the Walsperger integral formula. And in some sense, it is the analog of Kazdan orthogonality. It is trying to calculate the multiplicity space in terms of some kind of sure orthogonality. And uh, uh, his uh, integral formula, which is, uh, I think he has two papers, more than 100 pages each, in which he proves this integral formula, just about the integral formula. It is supposed to be local trace formula. Anyway, those things are far beyond me. So uh, uh, he proves a formula, so it is in, done in two steps. One, he writes down the right-hand side in terms of the germ expansion of the representation sigma and sigma prime. Yeah, and so there are some things like wild denominator and some discriminant functions. So something quite explicit. As I said, it uh, uh, specializes to Kazdan orthogonality integral on elliptic tori. And uh, the, the first part of the theorem is that this is a sum of absolutely convergent integrals. And this is good. This is done in some generality. 
And then the theorem that he proves is that this integral, which is convergent, is the space of home spaces in some cases. So in some cases, uh, the dimension of the home space is given by this complicated integral. And somehow, uh, it therefore seems most natural, uh, uh, given this theorem of Wolfsberger, which is that uh, in some cases, home spaces are represented by that integral. So the integrals have the property that they are bi-additive. They have all the features of Euler-Poincaré, bi-additive. So you know, it is most natural to say that the, uh, so this I propose as a conjecture that uh, the euler poincare characteristic for sigma sigma prime is given by Wolfsberger integral formula. And, uh, and the second part is that uh, uh, for the higher x groups are zero. So just like for GLN plus one, the higher x groups are uh, proposed to be zero so that uh, you, uh, when you are dealing with tempered representations, it is not the euler poincare which will e eventually intervene, but it, it will be just the home spaces. Okay, so in some cases when uh, uh, higher x are obviously zero, then uh, Wolfsberger's theorem is equivalent to, Wolfsberger's theorem uh, on the integral formula is equivalent to conjectural formula on the euler poincare Part two is the simplest explanation of Wolfsberger's theorem for tempered representations, and uh, they are analogs for unitary groups due to Raphael Bujar Plasis. And uh, to, in my mind, it's an important problem to find a general integral formula. So somehow, uh, Wolfsberger's formula is too specific to classical groups, and uh, if you look at the formula, it is indeed too specific. All right. So uh, I uh, suggest a case uh, when uh, one is dealing with principal series representations that uh, the conjectured formula on Euler-Poincaré becomes one, and uh, which is a consequence of the earlier propositions and not by Wolfsberger integral. So because here one may be dealing with reducible principal series, so the uh, earlier calculations give you this. Uh, so, you know, uh, somehow uh, the Wolfsberger integral formula makes one think that, you know, it is some kind of a riemann rock theorem. And uh, uh, very quickly, riemann rock theorem says that if you have a coherent sheaf on some uh, projective algebraic variety, then Euler-Poincaré can be written in terms of something simple associated to the sheaf and something associated to the variety. And this is the feature of Wolfsberger's formula. There are germ expansions associated to your representation, so which give you, which use only simple properties of the representations, and then they use some properties of the geometry of the space, which is the elliptic tori. So uh, to me, it looks uh, quite uh, closely related analogy. Uh, uh, so, conjecturally expressed uh, as uh, something uh, is a function on the set of elliptic tori and uh, uh, given by some uh, discriminant functions. Okay, so um, I want to come back to this remark I made about uh, uh, discrete series representations not containing any submodule. You know, in some sense, uh, Study of submodules seems like as natural a question as study of quotient modules, in some sense. Uh, and indeed, in the context of real groups, uh, this was a big study which uh, Toshi Kobayashi did. Uh, uh, he has uh, many, many papers, this is just one of them, in which uh, he looks at uh, AQ lambdas, and he uh, looks at how they decompose when you restrict it to certain subgroups, and uh, he arranges things such that it's a direct sum of submodules. So somehow, he, not only submodules are there, but it's a direct sum. But uh, I think in, in the PRD context, uh, 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 home spaces are never known to be non-zero. So somehow, uh, uh, you, you have pi1 for a group G, uh, so uh, GLN plus 1 and GLN, and uh, 
more or less examples seem to suggest that this home space is al almost always zero, but this is not quite correct, and in the next sections we see how to answer this. So uh, uh, this theorem uh, is uh, due to Schneider and Stuhler. Uh, uh, it's a very general theorem about uh, x i between pi pi prime and between pi prime and so, okay, so there is this uh, uh, involution on the representations of a PRD group called aubert jelwinski involution. So there is involution on finite length representations of a reductive PRD group, uh, which takes irreducible representations to irreducible representations, and uh, uh, they prove that, uh, uh, so I have denoted that involution by d pi, and they prove that for irreducible representation pi, x of a particular uh, d pi is non-zero, and there is this perfect pairing between x i pi pi prime and pi prime d pi. So it allows you to construct questions as a cosine to questions as a sub. So uh, that is their uh, paper, and uh, with Madhanori, I have a small uh, addition to their work, so somehow they work with a central character, and for, uh, especially for application to GLN, one doesn't want to fix the central character, and it's a bit of a non-obvious issue. So uh, I wrote a small paper. So you know, here is a very simple application of that duality theorem. Somehow, it's a question only about GL2, but it's still uh, somehow curious theorem. Uh, it is basically about trying to decompose tensor product pi1, tensor pi2 of uh, representations of GL2 and asking which representations appear as a submodule. So following is a complete list of irreducible submodules pi of pi1, tensor pi2. So of course, supercuspidals, if they are there as a quotient, then they will appear as a sub. But the only other representation which appears as a submodule is the Steinberg, and it appears in tensor product of two irreducible principal series of a certain kind. So there is a very precise uh, result, but as I said, it follows quite directly as a simple application of the duality theorem. Okay, so uh, I, as a final slide on this matter, but there will be one more slide, uh, a, a clear picture seems to be emerging about x i pi 1, pi 2, when pi 1 and pi 2 are tempered representation, one for the bigger group, one for the smaller group, is that in such cases, x i pi 1, pi 2 is non-zero only for i equals zero. On the other hand, pi 2, pi 1 is zero for i equals zero, so no wonder branching is usually not considered as a sub-representation and shows up only for i equal the split rank of the center of the levy. So somehow, in this tempered situation, it's only one non-vanishing x i which one can predict a priori, which x i. Okay, so I just want to end with this uh, slide, template from algebraic geometry. Somehow, uh, uh, there seems to be, in terms of uh, results, uh, very close uh, analogy between uh, basic theorems in algebraic geometry and what seems to be becoming the case here. Um, so I'm just listing some of the basic theorems, finite dimensionality, vanishing, semi-continuity theorem, riemann rock theorem, Kodara vanishing, shared duality, and then the special role played by the projective space. And uh, they all seem to have very uh, closely related analogs. Maybe in some cases for similar reasons, but uh, in any case, PRD groups are somehow not algebraic varieties in the sense of algebraic geometry. So it's uh, uh, all right. So thank you. Are there any questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. As I said that this Kazdan orthogonality is uh, done only in characteristic zero. Also, I think the wolfsburg age proofs are also in characteristic zero. So, I, I, in some sense, uh, I think uh, all the basic theorems are all supposed to be valid in all characteristics. 
But I think when there is harmonic analysis of a deeper kind, then somehow my proof is valid in all generalities. Yeah, oh yes. Okay, okay, very good. My proof is certainly valid in all generality because those are based on software methods. So um, for GLN plus one to GLN or also for classical group, all my analysis is general because they are softer and simpler. Yeah. So, uh, so you, you indicated uh, some analogy with uh, uh, immunobacterium uh, for certain varieties X. What kind of varieties uh, do you have in mind? You know, I mean, as I said, uh, this is a Wolfsburg integral formula. It expresses the Euler Poincare EP pi 1 pi 2 in terms of some uh, integral on elliptic tori. So these are. Uh, these are not algebraic varieties. I think I am saying this more in terms of analogy. That, you know, riemann roch theorem says that the euler poincare is expressed in terms of simple invariants associated to a certain variety and certain sheaf. So here, so to say, the group is the ambient object. And associated to the group, there is this, so to say, variety consisting of set of elliptic tori. And on the set of elliptic tori, there is this uh, uh, invariant which is uh, given by the uh, discriminant function or the wild denominator. So those are the invariants associated to the variety G group. And then there is something related to the representations, which are the germ expansions. And the germ expansions are not as complicated as the representations because you know, they capture only some amount of information. Understand this speaking